Well, reading through the comments of the last few videos has been absolutely fascinating. Our deep dive into bulk K factors and greases um, has elicited some amazing comments. Thank you so much. We've got everything from the advanced engineer tribologist who say that we're not going far enough into the detail right the way to the home mechanic learning about the implications of using Threadlock for the first time. Brilliant, fascinating. Thank you so much for all your input. What I wanna do in this video is just go a little bit further, but also we need to remember what this channel is. We are not engineers. We are not trying to redesign this. We are not trying to recalculate stress and tension. We're also not a factory. We're not manufacturers. We're not trying to make something to the design specifications. Our role as mechanics in all of this is to make all of that work. Take the engineer's design and whatever the factory produced and make it work, not just when it's fresh out of the box, but also once it's been used and it's been corroded a little bit and pre-installed compounds have come off and the instruction manual's gone missing. That's our job as a mechanic to execute that uh, safely and as best we possibly can. We're not here to try and recalculate stress equations. We have to assume that the engineer has already done that and we just need to execute well. Essentially, as mechanics, we can only control the variables that we can, which are normally cleanliness, lubrication, and torque. So when we talk about K factors and greases, we are not trying to be engineers. We're trying to be competent technicians to execute the engineer's design. Okay, let's go back to our torque equation, if you remember. T for torque equals K, the K factor, the friction of the bolt by the dimension by the clamping force preload. So. Here is the full equation for those that are interested. Yep, as you can see, completely impractical to use in a workshop. What this equation is essentially asking for is the individual thread geometry of a bolt and then the coefficient of friction of the actual threads and the bolt head. Now, there's a document called VDI 2230 that tells you how to measure all of this, but they've also done some more practical applications of it, which is what we're after as mechanics because we have got no way of measuring the individual pitch geometry of a bolt. All we can go on is ISO standards. We also have no way of measuring the coefficient of friction of a bolt or the bolt head. And in fact, if you want to get really technical, there's actually a percentage of how much of the friction is made up from the threads and the bolt and the actual stress of the bolt. What we are trying to achieve in all of this is essentially the preload camp clamping force. And the bolt is gonna be under an element of tension. It's like a little spring. So as we do it up, it just stretches a little bit. And it's that that actually provides the clamping force, that tension. Now, as someone pointed out in the comments that we should be talking about torque and tension. Now, we have no way of measuring tension in a workshop. In fact, there is actually an equation, I think it's called von Mises. I might have got that name wrong, but anyway, we have to assume that the engineers who designed a component have already done those equations for us. They have also stipulated what type of bolt and the coefficient of friction that they are expecting. And then they can present that to us in a torque setting that we have to use in order to achieve the bolt tension and therefore to achieve the clamping force intended. It's good that we understand it, but it's not something that we can measure or influence in a workshop. The only thing that we can influence is the torque settings and how we use our torque wrench. Yes, I've already given Jake some shit about that. But the other thing that we can control is the cleanliness or the lubrication on our bolts to make sure that we are hitting the desired bolt tension and ultimately the clamping force that the engineer who designed the component actually intended, which is why we have the simplified version of the equation because all we need to know is the K factor. You can think of the K factor that you see written in the technical data sheets that I showed you in the last video as a number that is taken into account or factored in all of those different elements to give us one workable number that we can use practically in a workshop. Now, you have gone looking for those data and sometimes you found it and sometimes you haven't, brilliant. Now, you are only ever going to find a K factor on a product that is specifically designed for threads. So you will see it on Loctite 248, for instance. You will see it on Wicon anti -seas. You won't see it on Peerless OG2 or Maxima Assembly Grease. So even though it says Assembly Grease, it's not a product that was specifically designed for 
threads. So in that case, that VDI 2230 document has essentially gone out and benchmarked lots and lots of different variations for us to come up with a class of friction. So we might have something like a black oxide bolt compared to a zinc plated bolt or an anodized aluminium bolt. They'll all have a different slipperiness. And then the compound that we are going to put on top of it is the Loctite. You can see how this suddenly gets very, very complicated. And the whole point of that VDI 2230 is to present something that's actually usable. <laughs> um, and so if you go looking for it, you're going to find lots of ways people have translated it. I've got an example here from the Worth website where they put things into classes and they've gone through some common examples of bolts and some of the common lubricants and then given you a K factor range. So if you're trying to use a grease that is not necessarily for thread, you will probably find a document out there somewhere that puts it into a class that you can use. As I showed in that previous video, a couple of points isn't going to change the world. When you're almost half the K factor, then you have problems. So talking of which, the other really fascinating thing that came out of this video was what problems have you been having? So I've got this collection of stuff here to try and talk through it because it was absolutely fascinating. Stem bolts is probably the most common. You won't normally snap a bolt. I presented that as a worst case scenario. What you'll probably do is the steel bolt or the titanium will be the harder material and you will strip the threads out of here. Now the other thing that came up is you'll find quite often on stem bolts that there will be a little washer attached to this and that washer is actually really important. And how many of you have taken your stem apart and then dropped that washer and it's gone under the kitchen cabinet and you go, oh no, I'll just put it in without it. That washer is critical for the friction. It is actually really important. So if it's missing, you need to sort of somehow account for that. You're not going to be able to calculate it. You just need to be aware that if you've chosen to emit the washer, you are going to be adjusting the friction. Ideally, go hunting for that washer, put it back in place. So these quite common other ones that came up with Shimano Q's cranks. These are actually a relatively soft aluminium and we are still threading steel axles into it. And the Shimano documents say use the anti-seize grease for this, which is great. That's got coefficient of friction of about 0 0.16. Someone was saying that they were using the, the Muckoff copper slip, which has got an incredibly low coefficient of friction. And then they were still doing these pedals up to the 35, 40 Newton meters as stipulated in the manual. And they were stripping the threads in this. Now they were blaming the poor quality of the Q's components. Yes, it probably is a slightly lower grade of aluminium, but at the same time, if you had stuck to the instructions and used the anti seize it talks about, you probably would have been okay. Here's another common one, flat mount bolts, or even if you have a suspension fork, I think every single mechanic has probably seen a mountain biker who has got a lower leg with the threads stripped at some point. It's really, really common. So that definitely came up in the comments. The other one was these flat mounts. These are not always hollow, they're sometimes blind. And if you diligently put some grease on here and then screw things in, you're essentially creating a little pool of grease at the bottom. So one, you have lubricated threads, which are always intended to be thread locked, but also you've made a little pool of oil at the bottom there, which can't compress. So you go tighter and then eventually thread strip. Now, stripping these threads, gets really, really expensive. And then bottom brackets, and on these, we're actually going the other way around. People were putting like PTFE tape on it and then still doing it up to 40. Now, if you put PTFE tape on this, you're actually going to increase the friction. So doing it up to 40, you're probably not got tight enough. In fact, I made a video about this, oh God, a long time ago, after I was watching some Instagram, I putting PTFE on their threads. And you're right, you've got to now do your bottom bracket up even tighter to get to a clamping force to stop it moving because now you've increased the thread friction. Now the other one was the cassettes because the SRAM ones come pre-lubricated and the Shimano ones don't have any lubrication on them at all. But if you use something very slippery like the copper slip and then do them up to 40 Newton meters, that is an incredibly large clamping force. And that is where threads get damaged. And again, I think you've all probably seen stripped threads on a cassette lock ring. So yeah, thanks very much for putting those examples. Some of you came through private message and some of you came through the comment section. So well done for being brave enough to do that. Absolutely fascinating examples. Now there's one more thing that came up actually was 
a few mechanics out there were saying, I've always done it this way and I've never had a problem. Um, Paul, you're talking bullshit. Okay, I would probably call this survivorship bias. Just because something bad hasn't happened yet and you've existed on quite a lot of luck doesn't mean that something bad isn't about to happen. Remember, if you were doing up something like this once, you might get away with it. By the time you've undone it uh, and then done it up again, that situation is getting worse and worse and worse and we're probably not far away from uh, critical failure. The one that we probably see most common in this is actually Campagnolo crank bolts, especially the titanium ones, where you get away with it once, but the second time you do it, when you've got a bit of galling on the threads, the second time, ah, oh, nightmare. Hopefully, uh, if that was you, just now you know. Go and look up the K factors, think about your torque settings, and hopefully just make some more intelligent decisions as you go, and hopefully you won't ever have a problem. Okay, that brings me on to something I'd really love your feedback on, and that is the possibility of starting up a map deck technical school. Something pitched at Soul Traders, independent mechanics, people working in bike shops, the really enthusiastic home mechanic that might be looking after a little fleet of family bikes, of high performance machines, that sort of thing, uh, where we can go into a bit more detail. The chats will be a bit more like this. There'll be a series of, of live seminars and really sort of more technical stuff that you wouldn't normally see on YouTube. I think it would be a great idea. It would have to be something that we have to charge for rather than being free on YouTube, because YouTube tends to suppress videos that get too technical. They've got to keep them entertaining. Otherwise, if YouTube recognizes that you flip away and come back to it, it recognizes it as not a very entertaining video and therefore doesn't always serve it. So we're looking at trying to build up a really good resource of videos like this, but actually go a little bit deeper that you can dip into uh, when you need to. Hopefully the subjects that you never knew you needed to know can be presented in a more of a friendly environment. So if that's something interests you, please put it down in the comments. Like I said, it's something I'm toying with and I would love to know what the general interest is in some sort of professional mechanic CPD and whether we can provide it. Okay, the last thing, um, I wanted to do a little bit on Greece. Now, I want to show you another Instagram post. <laughs> You've got to love Instagram. Um, I'm not going to call this mechanic out because he is trying really hard to do a good job. You can tell he's putting all the love, care and attention into this job, but he's just getting it a little bit wrong. So as it rolls, just see if you can spot some of the mistakes and then we'll go through it bit by bit. What we have done here, first of all, uh, this is a DT Swiss hub. It looks meticulously clean. Now DT Swiss bearings will normally come with a lithium complex grease in them. It might not be as sticky as XHP222, they tend to be a little bit more slippery than that. So if you do want to replace the grease in them, try and stick to the lithium. I'd probably go for Mobilith SHC100, but ideally what I would do, so I'm not entirely sure what grease is in it. They kind of assume that if you're going to do that, you're going to be replacing the bearings, I guess, is um, clean it all out with a contact cleaner, make sure all of that is gone you know, and dried out completely before you then inject a new grease. If you want something waterproof, mobile XHP222. If you want something higher performance, SHC100. And you only need to inject it about 50 to 60% of the way around. You just go the whole way around, rotate the bearing, and then put the seal back on. If you overfill it 100%, all that grease is just going to ooze out and it will just restrict the performance of your bearing. The next thing he did was he used the special grease, this pink stuff that mechanics are well familiar with, and that is the right thing to use for these ring drives. It's a proper ratchet grease there. You can adjust how loud you want the free hub by how much grease you put in there, but you really don't need very much. So that's all good. Then the next thing he does where it gets a bit oh, shuddered is covers the axle in this white lithium grease. Now, it might be some quite good quality lithium grease, but it's still going to have that zinc oxide in there, and it's still a very, very thick grease. Now, the problem with this is that when you slide all this together, that grease is not going to stay put. It is just going to get squished and pushed into one area. And what that'll do is it'll act like a little hydraulic lock and essentially affect the preload of your bearings, or in some cases, it'll affect the preload on the actual ratchet itself, depending on sort of the tolerances built into that specific hub and how 
aggressive and how generous you've been with that lubricant. Now, if you really wanted to lubricate this axle, the right thing to do would be to use the DT Swiss Universal Grease. This is a very slick grease, not dissimilar to SRAM butter, to be fair. And the only reason you'd do that would just be to the aid assembly of that shaft going through and give it a little bit of corrosion resistance. Um, you really do not need to use very much at all. We don't want it to all just bunch up as it slides past the bearings. And the thing is, if you add another grease in there, remember the centrifugal force of this hub rotator is just going to fling that out. And all that grease that you put on the axle is not going to stay on the axle. It's going to get flung off. It's going to mix in with this grease and you're just gonna end up with a really horrible grease cocktail. And if you've overfilled your bearings with this, this is the Shimano Premium Grease, also known as Autol Top 2000, a different type of grease. It's, it's got uh, a different chemical formula. It might not actually work with all of those um, things. It might not completely damage it, but why take the risk? Because then you have a cocktail of three greases and none of them are going to be performing as they should. And of course, the last thing he did was absolutely cover this outside with copper slip. And you can see how runny it is. It's quite a liquid grease. And again, that will fling off and run everywhere. Gravity will let it seep and centrifugal force will fling it everywhere. You only need to put that little bit on the threads. Most SRAM cassettes you will find there are plastic bits at the end to help with the preload. So just follow the instructions. And then on the disc side, again, you don't need to put any grease on that at all. Centrifugal force will blow that out. It will cover your disc rotors. I hope I've labeled my point a little bit. I say, this is fairly typical of what we see in cycling. Someone really trying to do a good job, but just hasn't quite thought about the grease cocktail that they have presented or even read the instructions deep enough, or perhaps even think they know better than the manual. Okay. And the lastly, I just want to finish off with the final thought of this video, and that is, this is not gonna get any better. Remember that Schmolke have released carbon fiber bolts. Just let that sink in for a second. Now they have said that the bolts are not for clamping purposes. They're for things like holding your water bottles on. And it blows my mind that cyclists will spend hundreds of pounds to save two grams, absolute nutters. But that is the way that we are heading. You know, we are still driving bizarrely for lighter and lighter and lighter. And as we do that, we need to be much more aware of the clamping forces, tensile strength of our bolts and all sorts. So hopefully this video has highlighted a few things to be aware of. Okay, I hope that video was really helpful to you. Um, I've enjoyed making this series. I think we're gonna move on from this. Now, the grease stuff, um, I'm still going away. I want to make that a really good evergreen piece of content. This is why I've been buying in some stuff that I can really go into the data sheets with and the technical stuff rather than sort of our half filled syringes and grease pots we've got downstairs to make that a really good video. So you wanna see that get subscribed, that's coming probably in the next few weeks. And please let me know what you think about the MapDeck Technical School. Love to know your thoughts. Right, back to the workshop.